Evening ladies and gents, it's uh, Simon Brown here, not doing this evening's presentation, that will be Keith McLachlan, really looking at uh, price earnings models, he did an overview of different valuation models uh, in the webinar for October, and then we're looking at the various different ones, starting with price earnings, most definitely the most popular, uh, perhaps the easiest, and I suppose Keith will help us understand if it is as good as it's all claimed out to be. Uh, Keith, as always, you find at uh, smallcaps.ca.za, there's a daily update in his blog there, and he's a senior equity analyst. Uh, you find him at Tevye Stockworking and on Twitter at Keith McLaughlin. With that, I'll hand over to Keith. Hi, guys. Thanks for dialing in tonight. Um, I'm sure you guys recall, but to, uh, tonight's about uh, fundamentals of equities. We've worked through the, the various fundamentals, um, of which, let's summarize them. The four pillars of fundamentals, first of all, is profitability the aim of the business, liquidity, which is very simple, it's about cash, cash generation, and cash is king. Second one is solvency, debt, the amount of debt, the right amount of debt to, uh, to uh, maximize shell returns versus the risk that it brings into the business, and then management. It's really, when you're investing in equity, you're investing in people. So the conclusion is, is we are looking at the fundamentals to lead into evaluation and eventually an investment decision. Tonight, we're looking at um, one of the one of the uh, valuation models, and this one is the price earnings ratio. So first of all, let's define the price earnings ratio. For those those who don't know, the price earnings ratio or the PE ratio. From now on, I call it PE ratio because I'm from PE. Um, is share price divided by the earnings per share equals the price earnings ratio. Now, earnings per share, remember, is profit divided by the number of shares. In other words, it's the amount of earnings attributable to one single share in a company. So it's the price, one single share in a company, divided by the earnings attributable to one share in a company is equal to the price earnings ratio. Now, what does that actually mean? Uh, I'll go into that. There, isn't, there is an alternative, and this is a little old school, but you may hear, the, uh, hear guys talking about earnings yield. Now, the earnings yield and the price earnings are actually exactly the same formula, just the one is the inverse of the other. Price earnings is share price divided by earnings per share. Earnings yield is earnings per share divided by share price. So that, that out the way, I'm going to be talking about price earnings the rest of this presentation. Um, first of all, what exactly is a price earnings? What does it really mean and how best to explain it? Um, a price earnings is really tells you that if profits are constant, how many years would it take you to pay back the investment that you footed for that share? Because remember, remember, share price divided by earnings per share. Now, if, if earnings are constant, if earnings are constant, how many years will it take you to pay back your initial investment to that share? The major assumption there is that profits are constant. And profits, we know in the real world, particularly in equities and particularly in volatile markets like we are now, they are never constant. So there's pros and cons of the price earnings model. First of all, let's have a look at the different types of price earnings model because it's as simple as that formula, share price divided by earnings per share, there's lots of different types of price earnings. So let's define the different types of price earnings. First of all, you get historical price earnings. Those are based on the, uh, on the last 12 months' profits. The last 12 months reported and audited earnings per share. The JSC, if, if you look at most websites, you look at most news feeds, and you look at most newspapers, they uh, report price earnings ratios as part of market ratios. Now, that comes directly from the JSC normally, and normally the JSC calculates that based on IFRS, headline earnings per share. That's uh, defining what headline earnings per share are is, is a little outside of this, uh, this webinar, but as a summary, headline earnings per share excludes all once off profits or losses. So you're trying to reach a more normalized earnings per share basis. The important part here, though, is the audited profits. It's the last 12 months profits, and that's why we talk about historical PE ratios, or what they call a lagging price earnings ratios. You also get a concept called forward price earnings ratios. Remember, the market is always forward looking. You're investing in the future, not the past. 
So forward price earnings ratios are actually more important than the historical price earnings ratios. Those earnings have already happened, but what's going to happen tomorrow, next year, next 10 years? Forward price earnings ratios are based on the next 12 months forecast profits. Now, just like historical price earnings ratios have a big problem where 12 months historical is based on the past, forward price earnings ratios are based on the forecast profits. So already you can see a problem. What happens if the forecasts are wrong? Um, forward price earnings ratios include what we call forecast risk. Risk that you are just simply wrong with the future. Types of price earnings ratios. Now, we touched on historical, we touched on forward price earnings ratios. Now, which are better? Historical price earnings ratios are safer because there's no historical forecast risk. There's no forecast risk. Um, the profits are audited, the profits are disclosed, the profits are out there. Um, but forward price earnings ratios are actually more relevant because, like I said, you're investing in the future. So what is really the correct price earnings ratio to use? Um, ignoring historical and forward price earnings, let's have a look at the different ways to apply price earnings. You can have a look at uh, the price earnings of one share versus the market. In this case, for example, in JNC, there will be the Aussie index. You can have a look at the price earnings of the share versus the sector it's in. And if it happens to be a technology company, you have a look at the JSE technology index's price earnings. Bear in mind, all the JNC reported price earnings are always historic. So the market the price earnings will be historic. The sector price earnings will be historic as well. You can also have a look at it, a look against single comparators. If you're looking at the technology sector, maybe you're analyzing a search engine, it's very applicable to have a look at, at, at a, a similar, similar, longer listed, bigger comparator. In this case, uh, Google would be the obvious example, even though it's not listed on the JSC. Now, the nice thing is having a look at a single comparator, you can have a look at the historic, that's what's published, and you can also start to have a look at the forward price earnings, depending on broker consensus, Arnett, Bloomberg, depending on what access you have. The real question is, what is the correct price earnings? Um, there's one last one that a lot of guys don't look at. You can have a look at a single share's historical price earnings. It's what we call the average price earnings over, for example, a 10-year trading period. Now, in some small caps cases, um, the company hasn't been listed long enough for the historical uh, price earnings to mean anything. In other cases, uh, uh, companies have been listed for decades and decades. Um, so you can drill back and average the price earnings across every business cycle, across every change in the company, across everything, and reach an average price earnings for that particular stock. Once again, this is historical price earnings. It's not a forward price earnings. All of these have their pros and cons. Now, what all of those have in common is that you're working with relative price earnings. You, you, you're saying this share valued according to something else. So relative price earnings are, are comparing it in this case versus the, the share itself, that would be the average, versus the index, versus the market. Um, what are the problems? First of all, the, the relative or the comparative that you're comparing the price earnings of the share against, that comparative itself may not be fairly valued. In the previous example, if you're valuing a search engine versus Google's price earnings, and Google itself was overvalued or undervalued, you would have had the wrong answer. Not because you're taking the wrong approach, but because Google itself is undervalued or overvalued. Second of all, what you're comparing it against may not be a good comparative. If you're looking at, the, there's a couple of very, very unique uh, companies out there. Uh, yeah, for example, Pumalela on a JSC, it's, it's, a, it's a sports betting company, particularly horse racing. Now, there isn't really a strong comparative. You could look at it against the Aussie. Well, the Aussie is dominated by Anglo and Billiton resource companies. So what do their price earnings mean against a sports betting company? Very little. You can compare it against the sector, the leisure industry. Well, that's got Sun International, Gold Reef City. Once again, they don't do much sports betting, if any. Not a very good comparative. Then you can look at it against a Pumalele's history. It hasn't been listed that long. And also, the sports betting industry is arguably going online, and things are actually changing. Hence, the business model itself is changing. So maybe even the share's history isn't a good comparative. 
Now, you see the assumption when you're doing relative price earnings is that you're valuing itself versus something else. What you're really assuming is that the other thing is fairly valued. You are assuming that everything in the market or some things in the market or the other thing in the market is efficiently priced. Everything except the company you're valuing. In reality, that's actually a very dumb assumption. But it's an assumption a lot of people make. So bear in mind, as useful as relative price earnings are, they have that risk. The risk that actually what you're comparing against isn't efficiently priced, or the thing you're comparing against is efficiently priced. In other words, that assumption is unrealistic. So the conclusion is really simple. Um, what is the price earnings? It's the share price divided by the earnings per share. The price earnings ratio is in a world where profits are constant, which first of all we know is unrealistic, but assuming in a world where the profits are constant, the number of years it would take you to pay back that investment is what the price earnings actually is dictating to you. Um, and second of all, you get historical versus forward price earnings ratios. Remember, forward price earnings ratios are much more relevant, but they include forecast risk. Historical price earnings are published and stable, yet the past isn't important in the stock market, only the future is. And then remember, you can always compare the price earnings against the market, or against the specific index, or indices, or against peers in the market. All of them have their risks. All of, them, all of them have their challenges. If you understand that, you can navigate your way through the price earnings model. So the price earnings models, pros versus cons. First of all, price earnings model is simple, simple and intuitive to use. Um, the con is the price earnings model is potentially massively oversimplified. Remember, I've just walked through not not just all the good things, but all the bad things the price earnings model. Historical costs versus forward, forecast risk. Efficient market assumption where you're assuming everything except the assets you're valuing is efficiently priced. So it could necessarily over simplify, simplify your, your valuation. Now, that's, that is a theoretical overview of price earnings. What I've decided to do for future reference for you guys is that the valuation models are a little too long to put theory and a case study or an example all in the same webinar. So what I'm going to do is I'm splitting all future webinars into, and this is a good example, we did the price earnings theory now. Next webinar will be a price earnings case study. And we'll work through all the models, I'll point out the problems, I'll point out, point out the good points, and um, together, both webinars should give you a broader overview of a price earnings approach. So remember, this, because we only have a half an hour time slot, this one is, is aimed at just giving you a theoretical overview. Tune in next month for a full case study. Okay, guys, we're down to questions. Uh, we will, and Simon here, we will sneak that webinar in before the end of the year, sometime in December. Uh, two questions come through from Ian. Uh, folks, if you've got any questions, you can raise your hand. We'll activate your microphone, alternatively put them in the text box. Uh, Ian's first question is, earnings yield, basically you're saying ignore it. And I think that's very much it. I, <clears throat> earnings yield was something my grandfather was big on in the 60s and 70s. But Keith, I don't think anyone uses it anymore. Actually, uh, actually uh, it depends which, which model we should feel more comfortable with. Price earnings is, yeah, I'd love to say that... Uh, you know, financial analysis is, is, is a science, but it's more an art, and it's changing all the time. Um, and this is why earnings yield was a historical favorite. Currently, price earnings is, in reality, the same. There is an advantage to earnings yield, that price earnings, it, it isn't apparent at first that, that uh, can do this, but you have to invert it, become earnings yield. Now, remember, we go back to the assumption where earnings are constant. Earnings are constant. If you have your money in a bank account or in, or in a treasury bill or a bond or a foreign bond or a mezzanine debt or any sort of instrument where there's a fixed payment coming from it, what earnings yield really does is it gives you an interest rate to compare versus that. So earnings yields are still relevant, but they're probably more relevant for asset class decision. 
i.e. should I go into bonds, should I go into cash, should I go into equities, as opposed as opposed to actually an investment decision, because th remember this webinar is, is orientated around equity analysis. We are valuing equities and we're ignoring the rest of the world. Cool. Uh, another question from Ian is a case of can you use it on its own or is it something which needs to be part of a, a, a model, I suppose? Here's, here's a good example for, for uh, to answer your question. Um, we way down the line, we're going to start hitting the what a lot of people view as the holy grail of valuation models, the discounted free cash flow model, DCF. Now you get something called a natural, natural price earnings, and a natural price earnings is once you DCF the company and you present value all the future cash flows to a single point, the net present value of all those future cash flows. Compare that price to earnings. And you actually arrive at a naturalized price earnings. So a price earnings gives you a good sanity check. So you do a DCF and you arrive at a, arrive at, at, at a fair value that gives you a price earnings of like 500 to 1,000 or a million or something like that. You know already Im implicitly that that's probably a much too high fair value coming from the DCF. You have to relook at your valuation assumption, assumptions. So price earnings works very well as a sanity check. I would never use it in isolation. Actually, none of these valuation models are used in isolation, but they all tend to back each other up. And you have increasing confidence, so you're going to have um, you can know that you have arrived at what you feel is a very comfortable, fair value. All the models are pointing at it. I hope that answers your question. But uh, price earnings don't use in isolation. Very easy, very, very easy, quick, dirty method to arrive at a conclusion, but not always the best one. Yep, I think it's like in my trading when I talk about getting the wind at my back and getting many small things, and I think it's the same sort of process. Yeah. Um, another question coming through um, from St. Pierre, and he's asking about a webinar that I did a while ago on, and you re referred to it now, just to get the range, take a 10 or year view or so. I know we were talking about, many folks are talking about, but it's get that 10 year range, find a low average, a mid average, a high average, a low average is telling you cheap. Uh, my answer to that is yes, let's take Keith's point of view. Well, first of all, well, first of all that, that, that's, that's uh, the right approach, and I'd like to back up uh, just one of those other webinars. And we do have another one in past earnings, guys. Please, please have a big run and find it. Uh, and have a watch of it so I can add to this. Um, second thing you have to bear in mind is Bilton isn't a good example. Bilton is a cyclical company. And you'll tend to find that its, it's past earnings, the peak of the cycle is low, and the top of the cycle is high because it's very exposed to commodity prices. So you, you know, that approach gives you a good grounding for trading ranges. But it, unless you have a fundamental understanding of the profit drives, remember we go back to the four pillars of, of fundamentals, profits, liquidity, solvency, and management. Until you understand that, you, you cannot understand exactly how reliable the historical price, range, price earnings range really is. Fresh out the uh, guys at Canon, uh, Sepa Madiba and Adrian Seville and, and other folks talk about uh, through the cycle earnings. In other words, I don't know, they, they work in a seven year cycle. They say bulletins for the seven year cycle. Take seven year cycles earnings, add them up and divide them by seven because that gives you your peak and your troughs. Ladies and gents, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. So we're going to leave it there. 20 minutes, nice, uh, short and to the point. Um, as Keith says, there's others on, on price earnings and, and of course Keith's other, other webinars, including his first one, which was those four pillars of fundamentals. Um, we'll sneak the, the, the next part of price earnings into the second half of this year. Guys, can I just say one more thing? Because uh, I, I want to make the webinars relevant. So in our next webinar is going to be a case study on price earnings. Um, I'd appreciate if you submit either to me or Simon a suggestion for a company on the JNC that we can use for this. Um, something relevant, something you'd like, like to see our approach to it, um, and then, then we can add value to everyone. Yeah. Perfect. Send it to info at justonelap.com. Uh, my thanks to all of you for attending. My thanks to Keith McLaughlin. Remember, you find him you know, all over the place. He's a stockbroker, he's a senior equity analyst. He runs Smart Capital and Co. Twitter at Keith McLaughlin. Keith, thanks a lot. Always a pleasure, guys.